This also, this book has been given to the, the 110th Regiment, my regiment, to mm -hmm. Lieutenant Colonel Hickok, who is the historian of the 110th. I let him have it so he could go over it, and if anything, any mistakes I made, you know. Mm -hmm. But I tried to give credit to everybody's stuff that I used. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, we're rolling. Okay, this is an interview at the Buffalo and Erie County Historical Society. Buffalo, New York. It was the 23rd of August, 2006. Approximately 10.50 a.m. Interviewers are Mike Russert and Wayne Clark. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Albert W. Burgard, 95 Rock Street Place, Taiwan, New York. I was born uh, April 26, 1922. In other words, I'm 84 years old. Okay, where were you born? Buffalo, New Buffalo, York. Okay. Um, what was your educational background prior to entering service? Um, my last years, I think, were like high school. Mm -hmm. And eventually I went out to the University of Buffalo about two and a half, three years. That was after you were in the service? Yes. Okay. Um, um, GI Bill. Mm -hmm. Do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Where what? Where were you when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Oh, I'm, we just come back from our part of my mother's old homestead where we had a we had eight and a half acres and we farmed part of that. And on, on our way home, by the time we got home, we heard about Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. Did you hear about it on the radio? Yeah. What was your reaction to that? Do you remember? Well, I knew we were going to be at war with Japan. That's mm -hmm. what I'm sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you enlist or were you drafted? I was drafted. All right. Now you were drafted into the army uh, when? Um, in December, well, I think it was November, 1941, and I went to the uh, induction center and they took me to Fort Niagara where the base was, that where the base was back there where the inductees went. Mm -hmm. From there we took a train and went down to um, Camp Livingston, Louisiana. And I was with the 28th Division and from then on until I was uh, carried out on the stretch in the Hurtigan Forest. Okay. Um, what was your, how long was your basic training? Approximately. Well, it started in uh, Livingston, Louisiana. Uh, I don't remember how long it was mm -hmm. because uh, the 28th Division at that time turned into an amphibious outfit and we went to Florida where we practice amphibious training there. Was it 1942? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you were right, assigned right away to the uh, 28th right. Division? Right. I stayed with them all the time I was in service. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what kind of craft did you use in Florida for your assaults? Were they we used a power boat, which they run up on the beach, and then we used those uh, landing crafts, which is a picture in my book, mm -hmm. where they drop the ramp and you're on the shore. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then we practiced more in, uh, we went to Camp Pickett in Virginia, where we practiced amphibious landings in the Chesapeake Bay. And then from there we went to uh, uh, Camp Miles Standards, where we were re-equipped with new equipment for overseas. Mm -hmm. Okay, now what kind of weapon did you carry? I had, well, I had a, I had all kinds of weapons. I had a 45 and a carbine and an M1, and then I was assigned to a mortar section. I was the last ammunition carrier in a mortar section. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, when did you head overseas? From Camp Miles Stands, whatever the date was, that would be in my book there mm -hmm. somewhere. So. Okay. Um, before D-Day then, you went before D-Day. Well, let me get one thing straight. Okay. We were, um, we knew we were going to land, be on part of the landing because of the amphibious training we, we received. And we also made uh, more amphibious training in, I think it's the Irish Sea over and off of uh, Land's End over there around Wales someplace. Mm -hmm. And then we went to, um, a uh, and we, we spent time in uh, England also. Then from there we went to a like security camp 
in England, uh, I think a little bit north of um, Southampton, where we received new equipment again. Um, and of course, we were ready, waited for D-Day because that's what we were trained for. Mm -hmm. And in my book, as much as Eisenhower said he didn't plan for a second front there if D-Day failed, in my book I have the proof uh, that the 28th Division was planned for a D-Day landing. And then they substituted, I think it's the 2nd or the 4th Division, in our place and we were set aside in this security camp. We didn't know, I didn't know about it until after the war when I started reading about it. But uh, we were supposed to spearhead Patton's uh, army of tanks uh, up about 37 miles up the coast from D-Day. And that was either they were going to turn them loose on, I think it's the Brest Peninsula, and let them create a lot of havoc there so that D-Day could continue on. But when D-Day was a success, we were just set aside. We didn't go uh, ashore until I think it was the 26th of August, or I think in there someplace. And uh, then we landed on D-Day Omaha Beach and went inside, and then our first engagements were after, after St. Lo, when the 1,000 or 1,500 planes came over and bombed them. Mm -hmm. And we were supposed to take, I think it was the 35th Division's place, but there was a screw up there, so we didn't, and the bomb, thank God, because the bombs fell short of uh, St. Lo. They were supposed to run parallel to the American lines because then they could see where their bombs were landing. You know, and said they went over the top of them and they dropped them and then they were lost in the dust and stuff. And they bombed the 35th Division. Mm -hmm. And they had a tremendous amount of casualties there. Now, when you went ashore in Normandy, beaches, uh, was there still a lot of debris on the beaches? There was a fair amount of debris, and we saw a bunch of white stuff over on our left up above a little bit. We put the, the uh, binoculars on them, and they turned out to be American white crosses. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of them. In other words, they had time to bury the fallen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, St. Paul was your first offensive then? In, in the St. Lo was the first offensive. Well, we, we walked right through St. Lo. Mm -hmm. Right after St. Lo, the hedgerows were, were, and that's where we took off. Mm -hmm. And it was a bitch of a time in there. But here again, we sort of spearheaded a little bit for uh, Patton because one early morning when we woke up, I was on guard and he was some fellow, and we heard the tanks coming. We said, Oh, hell, we don't have anything to stop one of those things. But they happened to be uh, the vanguard of Patton. And he went right through us and into the, we broke out of the hedgerows and they broke out and he went next to where the offensive started. Now why did you find the hedgerow is such a difficult area? Have you ever seen a hedgerow? Yes, I'm just asking you for the... <laughs> because the Germans knew about them and they could defense them real easy. Now we had the same thing in Wales because it was just an overshot of of the hedgerows in France, and we practiced in them all the time, but nobody ever told us we'd be fighting the damn things mm -hmm. because the Germans had the advantage again because they could defense it real easy, and we could. We had to take each one, and that's when this genius of uh, some PFC or something developed a big, uh, like teeth on the front of the tanks to break through the hedgerows because mm -hmm. they'd hit them things full head. And if they weren't too deep, they'd go right to them. And if they didn't, they were stopped cold. And then the Germans could use their Panzerfist to disable the tanks because mm -hmm. their guns were much better than ours. Mm -hmm. Sorry for saying. Mm -hmm. This were the 88s that you're talking about. And the Panzerfist. The they're the they're uh, yes, the anti-tank weapons yes. were much superior to ours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, where did you go after you got out of the hedgerows? After we broke out of the hedgerows, we uh, went to uh, <clears throat> uh, Paris, where we were the first division through Paris, and we marched, uh, I forget that date I have it in my book again, and I asked our people how long it took, because I can't even stand 50 minutes on my feet anymore, and they said it took about nine hours to march through Paris, and then we were on the open. Uh, and we chased the Germans right on through. 
Now, were you treated as liberators as you marched through? Oh, yeah. Was it like? the, the French people loved us, yeah. We'd walk in and we'd go, as we went across France, you could walk out, walk in sober and walk out high eyed because the French got out their best wine and the whole bit gave it to us. And we drank it. <laughs> okay. Um, where did you go after Paris? After Paris, we brought, chased the Germans across the uh, uh, it, across the land there, and uh, then we come into Elsenborn where we had a little brief rest, and we saw that place. Now that must have been a special training camp, because it, the local inhabitants told us that the the French, the the, the English mosquito bombers come over at about 500 feet and bomb, bombed, uh, bombed them. They had huge bombs because they let craters anywhere from 20 to 30 feet in the ground and they were filled up with water and most of the barracks were destroyed mm -hmm. and we found a lot of little red things, they looked like cartridges about maybe an inch and a half to two inches long. We didn't know what those were for but uh, we went from there into the Siegfried line and we uh, captured a bunch of pillboxes there but this is one of the reasons why I want to expose the army and leave town so to speak because we went in there and we captured all those pillboxes and we pulled us out. Why the devil did we have to leave those pillboxes we had captured, pull out, and we had to take them again? And that's you never destroyed them. You just we, left. We, at the time we went, in, we didn't have the explosives mm -hmm. to destroy them. Mm -hmm. uh, but there was no Germans in there, no no Ireland in there at all. But the next time we tried, they were loaded with Krauts. Uh, they had taken over those perfectly good pillboxes. We had a fight for them again. We lost a lot of men there. And uh, they pulled us out of that eventually. And uh, we had a bit of a rest. We never had much of a rest. Most of it for re equipment and uh, replaced the losses that we had. Then we went out to the Hurricane Forest. Mm -hmm. Now, were you with the weapons platoon at that time? All the time. Okay. As Machine a, guns and mortars. Mortars, okay. All right, um, you want to talk about the herd of, herd of Not really, but okay. <laughs> no, I got, a, I got an article in there on the Hurdigan Forest. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote a bit of a uh, digest on the Hurdigan Forest. This one here, it's, I tried to digest it, you know, because I gave a few of those copies away. And it's about uh, the shelling that went on. There's a German general in there that said that he was on the Russian front. He was also in World War I, mm -hmm. as well as fighting on the Eastern Front, on our front. And he said he never had shelling like there were in the, what, what do they call it? The, um, The Hurricane Forest, but he called it something else, the Hurricane something. I got it in my book, anyways. But it was a tremendous amount of shells went down. What was, what was the daily life like there? Besides being shelled all the time, very dull. We didn't get any food, and everybody was wet because the winter or the fall rains would start. Mm -hmm. And we were fortunate enough to take over positions by the 9th Division, and they had dug in, you know, uh, pits. They weren't any deeper than this desk to the floor, and we could crawl in there and sleep, and also in the barrage camp we could get in there, and we'd come out and fire our weapons. Mm -hmm. Did you have winter gear at all? No, 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 all summer. Our feet were wet all the time, that's why I ended up with trench foot. And uh, Bradley, in one of his books, and I also quoted in there, said that they made a mistake because they sent, instead of uh, food and clothing, they sent ammunition, I forget what the other thing up. And of course, we needed the ammunition, but we moved so fast they couldn't keep up with us, with the divisions that were on the line. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Now, you were wounded at the Hurdigan Forest? Were you wounded at the Hurricane Forest? I never was wounded in all the time I was in service. I had a hell of a lot of close calls, mm -hmm. but I ended up with trench foot. After we escaped the uh, the trap that the Germans had us in, 
they phoned us up one night because all the electrical wires were down and everything. They, I think they radioed us. Uh, and they said that we were completely surrounded in there. We could, they couldn't get troops through to rescue us because we had gone on the uh, attack to save the 112th Division, which was trapped also. And uh, they said, you're completely surrounded and we can't get you out. So you're going to break up in small groups and get back the best way you can. Good luck, Ben. And that was the end of us. They wrote us off, in other words. So after dark, on the, early on the 9th of November, we broke up with the small groups and we left that area very quietly. We went across the Call Bridge, which my platoon sergeant and I discussed in the DeWitt General Hospital in California. They must have been held by Germans. But we were bigger than our group was 18 people. And we walked across that bridge held by the Germans were positive. But we moved so fast that we looked like them anyways because we were dressed a lot like the Germans. And we went right across there and escaped off of that. And then we went up to hills, which were a lot like some of the ones in Letchworth State Park, which anybody in New York State who has been around there know how steep they are. We went up that, the hills there. And when we got almost to the top, or at least halfway, somebody, we never had our helmets buttoned on because the Germans could come over and give it a pull and break your neck. So they were loose on our head and somebody must have leaned over backwards or something and their helmet fell off and it went crashing down the rocky slopes all the way to the bottom. And most of us thought that our position had been given away and uh, that we certainly were going to get some shells, but thank God we didn't. So we got to the top of this hill and we went across an open field and somebody challenged us in England and whoever led us out of that trap was one hell of a soldier. He talked to him in English and we, he let us pass and we went out to our company areas and we were so tired we didn't take it and lay down at all. We just fell down and went to sleep. And uh, in the morning when I woke up, <coughs> I was covered with the first snow of the season, November the 9th. I'll never forget that. It was like a blanket of snow on us. And the medics come around and they ask various fellows questions. They asked me if my feet hurt, and I said no, and I proceeded to uh, drop the hand of stand up. I dropped my M1, which weighs around nine pounds, on my foot. And they said, did you feel that? And I said, hell no, I didn't feel that. And they said, well, take off your shoes, and my feet were as white as the snow. So they had me lay down and uh, put a tag on me. And when they took my rifle, about eight inches of the top of it were broken up, it was completely destroyed. Uh, a piece of shrapnel had to come through sometime because I, and I never heard it, because I always had my rifle right next to me when I slept, was between my legs where I could keep it warm so that I had a fire that I could. So that was the end of my career with the 28. They put me on a stretcher and carried me out. I went through nine hospitals, including the one I got out of at Camp Upton, New York, in uh, 45, I guess it was. And what did they do to treat the trench foot? Nothing. We got a shot of liquor when we got out, and then they kept us on their sedation uh, because when the blood started to come back in our feet, we couldn't, you couldn't stand it. So they gave us some kind of stuff, morphine or whatever it was, I don't know. But they really hurt. And the only thing they did when we got to California, give us contrasting baths, uh, which were hot and cold water. I don't know which one was first. And then they said they had a new thing they were going to try out. They called it uh, uh, I got that in my book too, but I don't remember what it was now. But they pumped pure alcohol into your spinal column to try to get the uh, <coughs> blood to flow. And they told us that if we didn't take it, they'd court martial us. And of course, we thought we were all going to Japan anyway, so we said we're not taking it. Not all the fellows except about four of them. And we're not taking it, so if you want to court martial us, court martial us. So they had about four guinea pigs that they gave the alcohol to. The only thing they did was come out of a good drunk in about three days. And uh, they didn't do anything else but leave us alone. How many guys in your group ended up with trench foot? Pardon? How many fellows in your group ended up with trench foot? I don't know because myself and my platoon sergeant and another fellow from 
I think it was 110. We ended up in that hospital together, mm -hmm. but they might, might have split us up all over. But there's only, there's 18 guys come out of the battle with me. And there, there was other ones, I don't know, there weren't very many of us left out of 100, well, close to 200 guys. Besides being killed or, or injured or taken prisoner or whatever, uh, that was it. And there's a picture of the call trail and a time to heal in the book there, which shows the American and the, and the English and the American and the German uh, medics taking and giving first aid you know, to the troops. Mm -hmm. And I also, I didn't get in that because I had to be at my station, but uh, the fellows that went down around the close, around the close, uh, around the uh, first aid station said that they had the bodies piled up there about four high, about 60 feet long, all of our dead comrades, and they had two rows of those, and they said there could have been more. They started to salvage the guys, in other words, from burial. But they couldn't take them out of the herd, and the Germans wouldn't let us. But the, uh, some of the fellows that uh, did come out were checked by the Germans to make sure they weren't fit to fight. And then they let those guys go out there, walking wounded, and so on and so forth, from the medics. Well, that is all of us, unless you have some questions. Have you read much about the... Yes, I, I'm a collector. I bought all the books I could on the 28th. And some of the authors wrote me and wanted my book here, and give them, and I said, well, we can exchange information, and they didn't want to exchange information. They just wanted everything I had, and then the hell with me. So I said, mm -hmm. kiss it. You know, I mm -hmm. didn't give them a damn thing. Mm -hmm. Except, except the fellows who gave me a book or something like mm -hmm. that. I got the Bloody Forest from Jerry Astor and from uh, Dorothy Chernitsky, whose husband was in the other she sent her, her book about voices from the foxhole, which she had quoted from fellows like myself in the book. Mm -hmm. So, and I forget who else I gave it to, but I just did, didn't just give this thing away. We spent 13 years on it and give it to some guy so we could make some money, or mm -hmm. get it. Mm -hmm. There's that picture mm -hmm. there of the time to heal. Now I have a big picture. Do you want to hold that up and I can focus in on it? My sons gave me a big picture. Which, uh, How long were you in the hospitals total? The first time, seven months. And I didn't walk until very late in the season because my feet were so tender. Mm -hmm. Now, to come out to the house, I could show you the rest, but I'm not bringing it all down here. <laughs> okay. Yes. Here's some of my awards that I got. My daughter-in-law is making me a bigger picture. But like with those, I've got all the documentation that I didn't just go out and buy medals. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, I see you the bronze star. Yeah. What were you awarded that for? Uh, let me get it now. Uh, okay. <laughs> The Bronze Star for a meritorious achievement in ground combat against the enemy during World War II. I mean, I maybe should have got about six of them, but they gave you that one, maybe the documentation. Okay. Now, could you, uh, would you mind holding this up? If you hold it like this, Wayne can focus on it. Do you know where and when that was taken? When I come home from service, because mm -hmm. it doesn't have any awards or anything. It's okay, you can see. Okay, got it. Okay. Okay. Yep. I have a copy of my discharge here. I thought the most interesting part is when I took and copied these out. And I colored it to let people know where we were because I took and made these things, made the books for my kids, you know, mm -hmm. and years from now, long after I'm gone, they'll be able to pick this up and follow where I was. Mm -hmm. I, I have those all through the book. Mm -hmm. 
Now those are from three battles, I believe, and I think I gave credit to the author. Um, after you were discharged, were you hospitalized again? You said you were in seven months at one time. Yeah. No, they turned me loose and I uh, came home and uh, started dating Ellen. Went to University of Buffalo for two and a half, three years. And then I just got a job so we could get married and have something to live on. Okay, so you made use of the GI Bill? Yeah. Do you use it for anything else besides the college for your home? Or I studied uh, sales and marketing and stuff like that because that's what I went into. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you ever use the 5220 club? What was that again? It was uh, $20 a week for 52 weeks. It was like an unemployment. Oh, probably did. Yeah. I probably did. Mm -hmm. Um, did you join any veterans organizations? Yeah, I joined the VFW and then I quit because at that time you couldn't join unless you were overseas and I disagreed with that. Mm -hmm. I thought if you were in service you should, so I joined the American Legion and I was with them from, for quite a while. I, I joined the uh, Disabled American Veterans and I became a lifelong member there. Mm -hmm. Did you ever stay in contact with anyone that was in service with you? I wrote them all the time until they passed away. I still am in contact with my platoon sergeant, who is in California now, and he's blind and he's got other infirmities. Mm -hmm. So when I go to a union, I mean, there's not enough guys to play piano. Mm -hmm. um, did you, uh, how do you think your time in the service had an effect or, on your life? On my life? Yes. Made me more sure of myself. Mm -hmm. I don't back off from anything, you know, because I always go back to my service and how the things I had to go through and the hardships and that. Nothing's going to be as hard as that again. Okay. All right, well, thank you very much for your interview. My pleasure.